Well, thank you very much, Chad. And, and thank you for that. And afterwards, it'll be even more. Uh, I'm just a uh, Jersey guy who fell in love with lipids a long time ago. And uh, uh, it's a subject that is vast. Dr. Dayspring, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, try not to move as much um, while speaking because it's breaking up on our end. Well, I mean, you're seeing my head. I don't think I'm moving that much, so uh, uh, I'll try. All right, so uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's go get going here. What I hope to cover today is objectives would be that you should know that atherogenesis is defined by sterile foam cells in your arterial wall, and it's totally a lipoprotein pathology. Uh, lipoprotein composition and traffic of lipids is not only complex, it's extremely dynamic, second by second. Lipoprotein concentrations are not routinely measured in clinical practice. So the only way you know lipoproteins might be at play is by looking at the lipid concentration metrics and taking an educated guess. Lipid and lipoprotein concentrations do often correlate, and if so, they're said to be concordant. But if they do not, in other words, lipoprotein concentration looks ugly, but lipid concentrations do not, or vice versa, the metrics are discordant. And in discordant situations, risk always follows the lipoprotein concentrations in a significantly superior fashion than it does to the lipid concentrations. So, you know, here's a guy who was around even before me. <laughs> he was a world famous cardiologist from England, Paul Wood. And in his classic textbook of the time, so what I'm about to teach you today was not discovered yesterday. Look what he uh, said in 1958. The total serum cholesterol, which is normally around 150 to 300 milligrams per deciliter, is certainly related to atherosclerosis, but at best is only a crude blood disturbance. Cholesterol is insoluble in water and is carried in combination with lipoproteins, which are invisible macromolecules of various sizes and densities. But here's all you need to know. If you walk out of here at the end of this lecture and you understand that atherogenesis is mediated by the beta lipoproteins, whatever they are, that's what you need to know. You have to know how to recognize beta lipoproteins and you have to know how to modulate them no matter what your cholesterol metrics are in the blood. This is, if, if you're interested in lipids and you haven't read it, it's from 1967. It's a five-part series. The New England Journal of Medicine rarely does a five-part series on anything. And it's by three of the godfathers of lipidology, Don Fredrickson, Bob Levy, and uh, Bob Lees. And here's what they said in this, and this is available for free online. It's a four-part series. All abnormalities in plasma lipid concentrations or dyslipidemia can be translated into dyslipoproteinemia. The shift of emphasis to lipoproteins offer distinct advantages in recognition of lipid disorders. They knew it back then. Of course, they had ultracentrifuges. Nobody else did. So it's the first indication that, boy, I better understand lipoproteins. They go on to say that lipoprotein patterns offer the necessary information that is just simply not provided by analysis of plasma lipids alone. So here's the biochemistry structure of the lipids that are pretty much involved with atherosclerosis and cardiology. You notice in the top left-hand corner is free or unesterified cholesterol. That's the active form of cholesterol that can be changed into other molecules. But in the bottom right-hand corner is the storage or transportation form, the inactive form of cholesterol, where the, you can see the sterile rings are esterified to a carbonic acid, a fatty acid. Uh, and that uh, can't be uh, transformed into anything. It has to be de-esterified first. Of course, bottom left is triglycerides, which are three fatty acids esterified to a glycerol backbone. And in the top right-hand corner is a molecule that lines the surface of every one of your lipoproteins. They're phospholipids, also a glycerolipid, where glycerol is the backbone, but there are only two fatty acids, and there's a phosphorus-containing head group, which makes it somewhat water-soluble. So if we uh, look at a cross-section of the artery, I see three oil droplets there. 
Now my uh, diagrams today, blue is triglycerides, yellow is cholesterol, the little brown dots around the periphery represent your phospholipids. Now those collections of lipids there, those macromolecules would not be soluble in water because oil and water are not miscible. Uh, oil doesn't exist in water. So the only way lipids go anywhere in human circulation is they must be enwrapped by water-soluble proteins. The proteins that wrap lipids are called apoproteins or apolipoproteins, and there are two of them that are structural, and that is your apoB molecule, which enwraps, if you're looking closely at the diagram, your VLDLs, LDLs, also IDLs, which are not shown, and the uh, Protein wrapping your HDL particles is apoprotein A1. Uh, very crucial because you can measure some of these metrics in the blood and you're going to see why. Now, so once lipids are attached to these proteins, you have water-soluble lipid transportation vehicles. And that's how they get around the circulation because they are soluble in plasma. But making lipid transportation more complex, is these particles dynamically interact with each other every second of every minute of the day. They interchange the lipids they're carrying. And it's typically one molecule of triglyceride gets exchanged for one molecule of cholesterol ester. In the bottom left-hand corner, you can see there are apoproteins that are functional in transferring those lipids or inhibiting the transfer of lipids between particles. And they are crucially involved with the dynamic alteration of your particles. So again, pretty crucial concept. Lipids go nowhere in the human bodies if they're not a passenger inside a lipoprotein. And if you have sterols in your artery wall giving you atherosclerosis, is it guaranteed that a lipoprotein deposited them there in your artery wall? So which are the potentially atherogenic lipoproteins that can leave plasma, traverse the endothelial barrier, enter the arterial wall, attach to proteoglycans, get oxidized, and then internalized by monocytes turned macrophages? Well, it is the ApoB family of particles that have a diameter of less than 70 nanometers. That excludes the larger VLDL particles and it excludes the larger chylomicron particles. They're too big, they cannot get into the artery wall. But in the bottom, in the red box, are the ApoB particles that have potential to crash your artery wall and initiate atherosclerosis. It is smaller chylomicrons called remnants, smaller VLDLs called remnants, a very transient lipoprotein, intermediate density, your LDL particles, and if you have them because you need the wrong genes to synthesize that apoprotein little a, your LP little a particles. So those are the potentially atherogenic particles. If you don't have excesses of them, you're not getting atherosclerosis. Uh, the HDL particles, your ApoA1 containing particles, in general do not contribute cholesterol to your plaque. So that is typically not considered an atherogenic lipoprotein. Now, they first discovered these things by ultracentrifugation, where they were separated by their buoyancy. And you see all of the human lipoproteins right there. Notice whenever, in every group, they're a heterogeneous mixture of very buoyant or very dense particles, meaning very large or very small particles. Uh, don't, <laughs> if you're talking about an LDL, please don't say small or dense. Small means dense. Any lipoprotein that is dense is smaller than its predecessor. So it's redundancy to say small, dense, or fluffy, buffy, large, uh, buffy. Uh, donor. You can see that uh, part of the LDL family is that bizarre little lipoprotein that has the apoprotein little a attached to it or so. So you know, we can look at these further. So yeah, you can kind of classify them by their buoyancy, uh, but notice I'm highlighting now the ApoB family. And unique to them is there is one molecule of ApoB on every one of those lipoprotein species or subparticles. Hence, if I measure ApoB, I'm counting all of those particles there per deciliter of plasma, because there's only one ApoB per particle. So it's a very simple way to enumerate how many ApoB containing lipoproteins. Remember my first slide? You're looking at the beta lipoproteins right there. The other group, of course, is the uh, HDL particles, which are enwrapped by apoprotein A1. What, makes, what makes the fact that ApoA1 is not a useful metric to measure is that HDL particles can contain from one to five molecules per particle of ApoA1. 
So whereas ApoB is a very good and accurate concentration of the ApoB particles, ApoA1 is at best a guesstimate of how many HDL particles you might have. Understand these particles exist for in your plasma for a certain amount of time. Postprandial chylomicron half-life is a few minutes. Its plasma residence time might be a two hours. It's after you eat lunch or supper. So they come and go real quickly. That means they get delipidated and cleared. The VLD held half-life is about 30 to 60 minutes. Its plasma residence time is four to six hours. Again, it's pretty much a postprandial lipoprotein. The IDLs, which is a VLDL that has lost some of its lipids, it has an extremely short plasma residence time. And you, uh, other than rare lipid disorders, you're not factoring them or worrying about them too often. Now here's the crux. Your LDL half-life is one to two days and its plasma residence time is three to five days. You know what I just taught you? If you're measuring ApoB, because all of those are ApoB particles, 90% of your ApoB particles are LDL particles. And that's why LDL metrics have taken center stage today. 90% of your ApoB, the potentially atherogenic particles, are LDL particles. By the way, HDLs sort of stick around for five days, but they continuously remodel. They lipidate, get bigger, they delipidate, get smaller, then they relipidate, re-delipidate. So they're constantly acquiring, getting rid of lipids. And uh, important to know. Also, this may shock you. If you are doing some of the laboratory methodologies that measure particles, you can do an LDL particle count using uh, NMR spectroscopy or ion mobility transfer, and you can get an LDL particle count. Slide's got a lot of particles and it takes a while to show up. Wow, if I would have asked you before this, do you know that in your blood right now, you have 28 times as many HDL particles as you do LDLs? It's a good thing the HDLs are not so atherogenic or we'd be in big trouble. Uh, and if you are doing those advanced metrics, LDL particle counts are reported, reported in nanomoles, millionth of a mole, whereas HDL particles are reported in micromoles. It's a thousand fold difference. Uh, this is a reference where if you haven't read it and you're going into cardiology, internal medicine, or vascular disease, it's mandatory reading and it's by Ira Tabus. Show dictation box. I'm going to cut right to the uh, uh, take-home points. The key initiating process in atherogenesis is the arterial retention of ApoB-containing particles. These, I think that's what my first slide said. Uh, there you go. The particles that make it through your endothelial uh, barrier, either by gaps or they just transcytose right through it, are your ApoB-containing particles. And although many factors make that possible, the number one driving force of your ApoB, predominantly your LDL particles into the artery wall, is particle number. And how do you measure LDL particle number? You ask the lab to do apolipoprotein B concentration. Jim Althaus reminds us, the probability that a particle's cholesterol will be delivered to plaque depends largely on LDL particle number, how many LDL particles tend to the artery wall, become oxidized, and are taken up by foam cells. It's an ugly picture. If you're an invasive cardiologist, maybe you're happy if you see that if the patient's having chest pain. There is your cholesterol molecule showing you some of its uh, biochemistry properties. One end is polar, one end is nonpolar, meaning soluble in water, not soluble in water. It can be synthesized. Now everybody knows oh, the rate limiting step is HMG CoA reductase, and thank God we have a drug that inhibits that, because if you prescribe the drug, inhibit that enzyme, you're not going to make cholesterol, or your cells aren't. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. If you want to know, does this get more complicated? Here are the 37 steps necessary between HMG-CoA and cholesterol. Wow. But I you draw your attention to the two things highlighted in green at the bottom of the screen. They're the penultimate sterile precursors. Each of those is the last sterile that gets converted to cholesterol. So if I measure either of them in your bloodstream, which is very doable, many labs do it, they would serve as biomarkers that represent cholesterol synthesis. Are my cells making too much cholesterol or are they not making it? I'll bet if I prescribe a statin or 
some of the other cholesterol synthesis inhibiting drugs, I could reduce lithosterol, desmosterol levels, and for sure reduce cholesterol levels. But cholesterol can also be absorbed, can it? We do have intestines and you do have bile when cholesterol can backflux from the bile into the liver. So there is a membrane transporter that inf influxes cholesterol. So if this is in your enterocytes, between your gut lumen and the enterocyte cytosol, the Neiman pick C1 like protein can pull in any sterols uh, that it might be in your gut, at least 50 to 60% of them. But once they're in the enterocyte, they don't have to stay there. Your enterocyte, if it decides, oh my God, we've absorbed too much cholesterol, can immediately evict cholesterol using what's called an ATP binding cassette transporter G5 and G8. So what really regulates cholesterol absorption is a happy interplay between the neiman pick c one like protein and the abc g 5 g 8 protein. We now know if you have certain SNPs of either of those causing hypo or hyperfunction, you're either going to get heart disease in excess or you're not going to get heart disease. And we do have drugs that can manipulate them. Crucial to understanding, those, both of those proteins are expressed not only in your enterocytes, pulling or evicting cholesterol from the gut lumen to enterocytes, but they also exist at the hepatobiliary border. So your liver can suck cholesterol right back into the liver from the bile if it needs it, or if the liver has too much cholesterol, it can evict cholesterol into the bile. And this is, when I told you lipid transportation is complex, Try and follow this. There's your liver, there's your gut. The liver has a cholesterol pool. Of course, that could be contributed to by synthesis of cholesterol. But cholesterol can traverse back from the bile right back into the liver, which can help maintain a cholesterol pool. Cholesterol can be excreted from the liver by being incorporated in ApoB, produced particles in the liver, VLDLs or LDLs, but cholesterol can be uh, pumped out of the liver into cholesterol receptor proteins, ApoA1. So most of the cholesterol in your HDL particles, in fact, has a hepatic origin. All right. The uh, liver can change cholesterol into a bile acid, and it can take either the bile acid or free cholesterol itself and evict it via the ABC G5 G8 transporters into the bile. It goes down your bile ducts into the gut. Of course, we eat, and we might eat some cholesterol, and those green things are you probably ate some veggies today, phytosterols, that look exactly like cholesterol, or well, they have slight structural differences. Of course. So absorption, they can be absorbed via that neiman pick c one like protein. So some of those uh, cholesterol molecules are going to enter the enterocytes, be put in chylomicrons, make their way to uh, your liver, or the intestine is more than capable of contributing cholesterol content to your HDL particles. In fact, it's a generalization. Patients with high HDL cholesterol often have hyperabsorption of cholesterol, and it's a clue for you. All right, making it more complex, if an HDL decides it wants to get rid of cholesterol, it can return it to the gut and be delipidated, and the gut can then excrete that cholesterol to the gut lumen where it can be excreted in the stool as you see here. Fecal excretion of sterols, cholesterol is the only way the human body can eliminate cholesterol. So uh, pretty important. The last stage of reverse cholesterol transport is having a bowel movement that contains cholesterol. Of course, at the ileum, bile acids get reabsorbed. Most of those do not get excreted in the stool, although they could be, and that is one way the body regulates cholesterol also. And those bile acids go right back to the liver and are reused. Now, here comes your circulating ApoB and HDL particles. I've already told you they exchange lipids. So you see all day long, they're swapping triglycerides for cholesterol. But sooner or later, they're going to return to the liver themselves. The liver has receptors that can internalize the ApoB particles, and the liver can either internalize HDL particles or delipidate them. Uh, would you all agree that that last phase I just showed you where a lipoprotein is bringing cholesterol back to the liver, we would call that reverse cholesterol transport? I think I just taught you something you might not know. A gigantic part of your reverse cholesterol transport 
uh, is performed by LDL particles, not HDL particles. If you want to know what the function of your LDLs really is, your physiologic function, it's to return cholesterol that is not needed to the liver. And where does an, an LDL get a lot of its cholesterol? HDL acquires it from tissues and transfers it to the LDL, which returns it to the liver. Uh, trust me, if you do a lipid profile, you see all these pathways I just showed you, you would have no clue which of these pathways are at play or not at play. And this is the shortcoming of trying to guess everything based on lipid concentrations. Finally, a new and emerging concept is LDLs, like HDLs, can also bring cholesterol back to the liver. And this is called transintestinal cholesterol efflux or TICE very important pathway also that we're just beginning to understand. We've all been taught that as the liver secretes triglyceride-rich VLDLs, they deliver those energy-packing triglyceride molecules to muscle cells or adipocytes for storage. Uh, they're hydrolyzed by lipoprotein lipase. That's called lipolysis. They shrink and shrink and shrink. And before you know it, a VLDL becomes an IDL. Because both VLDLs and IDLs are enriched with apoprotein A, which is a ligand for the LDL receptor, they're rapidly cleared, which in part explains their very short plasma residence time. But some of the IDLs undergo further lipolysis by a different type of lipase, and that is where you generate your LDLs. And remember, the IDL hangs around for an hour, the LDL hangs around for three to five days. It's because evolution wanted it to hang around for three to five days. But here's something that just is not taught. Everybody thinks every LDL came from a parent VLDL. Look at, and this is a paper well worth reading if you're going into lipids. 38% of the LDL particles that are in your plasma are not the result of VLDL lipolysis. They are directly secreted particles from the liver. So when you time, uh, comes time to modulate these things, the only way you're really going to get rid of LDL particles is by increasing your clearance, not so much their production. Now back to what I really came for to teach you about the lipid profile. Here's what you need to know. The lipid profile reports lipid concentrations to you. There is not a single reportage of a lipoprotein concentration in a lipid profile. They are at best guesstimates of do you have certain types of lipoproteins or do you not? LDL or H and HDL are lipoproteins. They're not laboratory tests. I really get annoyed when somebody runs up to me and says, oh, my LDL is 65 milligrams per deciliter. I said, no, you know, there's no such thing as a lab test called LDL. What you normally refer to is LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol concentration. And we'll describe what they are in a minute. Lipid metrics are primarily used because they were invented 50 years ago and they're cheap. And you know, there's a lot of trials that have used those. The only thing in the lipid profile that can serve as a goal of therapy to attest to the efficacy of your lipid modulating lifestyle or drug therapy is LDL cholesterol or non-HDL cholesterol. Triglycerides per se is not a goal of therapy, and HDL cholesterol is absolutely not a goal of therapy because we have plenty of proof that no matter what you do to HDL cholesterol, it doesn't change outcomes. All right, so let's dwell now with total cholesterol. Fasting is not required because most of those particles have plasma residence time beyond a couple of hours. So total cholesterol is simply the cholesterol within every lipoprotein per deciliter of your blood. Okay. But it's important to know that about 80% of the cholesterol measured in your total cholesterol uh, concentration is in ApoB particles. So if total cholesterol does nothing else, it is certainly a poor man's surrogate that your ApoB level is high. So that's why we screen people populations for FH and other disorders simply by doing a cheap total cholesterol level. Because if it's high, you know you're dealing with hyperbeta lipoproteinemia, or the odds are high. All right, I'd just like to shock you with something. How many grams of cholesterol are in the human body? Nine grams. You all know how much a gram is. Where is it in your body? Well, is it in the liver? Is it in your lipoproteins carrying it in plasma? Or is it in your peripheral tissues? Well, you can see almost all of your cholesterol is in your peripheral tissues. Uh, far less is in the liver. 
and stop telling people the liver is the major site of cholesterol synthesis in the body. It's not even close. The peripheral the tissue produces more and the brain produces more and the brain lipids do not interact with plasma lipids. How many of you knew that the majority of cholesterol in your plasma is not in lipoproteins, it's in red blood cells? We now know cholesterol that is in the membranes of your red blood cells is interactive. It can get into cells. Red blood cells can extract cholesterol from your tissues. Red blood cells can also exchange cholesterol with lipoproteins. So this is a new part of lipidology. We're going to have to factor in and understand red blood cell uh, lipidology way more than we do. Uh, the other thing to know is whatever your cholesterol concentrations are in the blood, they have almost nothing to do with the cholesterol that is in your cytosol or in your cells. Every cell in your body makes all the cholesterol it needs to perform proper cellular function. No cell in your body requires a delivery of cholesterol. Steroidal tissues get a little bit from delivery because, of course, they make a lot of cholesterol. Uh, they make uh, change into steroid hormones from cholesterol. But your other cells in your body are not going to die if your LDL cholesterol is 10 because that's not where they get their cholesterol. And that's why drastically lowering LDL cholesterol has been associated with virtually no downside in the clinical trials. All right, let's move on in the lipid profile. Here it is, the gold standard, right? Low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. But uh, I'm showing you two types of ApoB particles, IDLs and LDLs. Well, long before we ever could measure it directly, which would simply be the cholesterol within only your LDLs, we had to calculate it using the Friedewald formula. And that formula would actually, because labs didn't separate IDLs from LDLs, a calculated LDL cholesterol is actually your IDL cholesterol plus your LDL cholesterol. Now, IDL particles are very transient, they're not usually a player. But if you have the type three hyperlipidemia, it's all IDLs, so that would be a player in that, in that thing. Here's something to who, if you are an unfortunate human who has inherited the ability to make LP little a particles, that's an LDL particle. So LDL cholesterol is really the cholesterol within your regular LDL particles plus the cholesterol that's in your LP little a particles. And for those people who have extreme elevations of lipoprotein little a, it is a contributor to your LDL cholesterol concentration. Finally, with a little teasing here, stop. You only identify yourself as somebody who has no clue about lipidology if you ever use the adjective that LDL cholesterol is bad cholesterol. I just told you the main function of an LDL is to return cholesterol to the liver. So if I'm an LDL particle carrying cholesterol back to the liver, I would say I'm carrying good cholesterol because it's going to the liver. I guess if I knew this LDL particle is going to crash the artery wall, maybe you could say, well, that might have some bad cholesterol. But it's an idiotic term because we don't know where our given LDL particles are going. And it just diverts attention from ApoB, which is really the bad metric. Few of you are probably doing it, but there are laboratories who can tell you how many smaller LDLs you have or the cholesterol content of your small LDLs. All I'm going to say about that is if you're doing it and it's abnormal, it's a very good lipid or lipoprotein signal that the patient is insulin resistant. The diabetics have this. Let's get to everybody's favorite lipoprotein, HDL particles. Uh, and you see HDLs are a heterogeneous mixture of big and small particles. HDL cholesterol simply refers to the cholesterol content of all your HDLs. Here's a second take home point today. When you look at HDL cholesterol, it has zero, no relationship whatsoever to the dynamic process called reverse cholesterol transport. So stop thinking if HDL cholesterol is high, they have great reverse cholesterol transport. If it's low, they do not. It's idiotic. Think if HDLs are supposed to bring cholesterol back to the liver, and that's good because that's reverse cholesterol transfer, why the heck would HDL cholesterol be going up? It should be going down if my livers are delipidating my HDL particles. So it's an old term, but all it does is confuse you and your patients. So stop using that. And Please read every current guideline. None of them want HDL cholesterol to be used as a judgment of the efficacy of any treatments you do, because there would be no trial data supporting that raising that metric matters. You want to do it, go ahead, but I don't know what it tells you. 
I know if you lower ApoB, you're going to save lives. And just like stop using the term bad cholesterol, stop using the term good cholesterol. Half of the cholesterol in an HDL, which it sucked out of your cells, is then transferred to an LDL using cholesterol ester transfer protein. So you mean to tell me in one second that cholesterol molecule that's in an HDL is good, but what do you call it when it's immediately transferred to an LDL, which has potential to return it to your artery wall? Again, it's an idiotic old term. Stop using it. It's confusing and it diverts attention from where attention should be focused. Here's the misunderstood lipid, tubby triglycerides. And typically it's done fasting. More and more guidelines say it doesn't matter. Just look at it and then make judgments. Uh, triglycerides is like total cholesterol. That was the cholesterol in all your particles. Triglycerides simply measures all of the triglycerides in every lipoprotein per decimeter of your plasma. So you have ApoB triglyceride, you have ApoA1 triglyceride. Typically, HDLs carry very little triglycerides. Normally, you need to do LDLs. Most of the time, your trig should be in VLDLs or very transiently in a postpartum fashion in chylomicrons. I like to teach people how laboratories do measure triglycerides because it's just, I don't think it's taught anywhere. So you see a triglyceride molecule, it's got that three carbon glycerol backbone with three fatty acids. Laboratories get a, a tube full of that and laboratories add a lipase to it, which immediately hydrolyzes the fatty acids off of the glycerol. So you're left with three fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. And the lab simply measures glycerol because there's one glycerol on every triglyceride and there's very other few other things in your body that cause, cause glycerol to be present. Glycerol serves as the substrate by which laboratories report triglyceride levels. There are a few people though who have certain enzyme deficiencies where they can't catabolize glycerol. So they have what's called glycerolemia. If you happen to have one of them and you send their blood for analysis, their triglycerides are gonna come back as 800, but they have almost no triglycerides in their blood. All they have is glycerol. That is a phenomenon called pseudo hypertriglyceridemia. And you better recognize that because otherwise you're going to start treating people for hypertriglyceridemia who need zero treatment because they don't have hypertriglyceridemia. So uh, be careful. Uh, well, a clue to that would be if you have a triglycerides of 800, your serum should be lipemic, but few doctors are spitting the blood anymore and looking at them themselves. Oftentimes HDL cholesterol is low if trigs are up. It wouldn't be so in these people. So there are other clues. I just like to point out what the AHA said about triglycerides in a phenomenal statement, which you need to read. What is a normal triglyceride level? And I look, go to the right. You, you see the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile. And most of the time with a lipid dis, uh, parameter, you want to be in the lower 20th percentile. So what is the lower 20th percentile of triglycerides? In men, it's 85. In women, it's 74. What is the 50th percentile? In men, it's 122. In women, it's 106. Most people would say that's a normal triglyceride. It's not a normal triglyceride. That means 50% of the human race has less triglycerides than you do if you have either of those. And the other crucial thing you know about triglycerides, look at that green box in the bottom. Rare for an African-American to have hypertriglyceridemia. Hispanics can be loaded with it. But African-Americans who have a lot of metabolic syndrome based on hypertension, glucose, and waist size rarely meet the metabolic syndrome criteria of high triglycerides or low HDL cholesterol. So the triglycerides is not such a useful metric in that population. Just published this week online, just goes to show you, if you really want to tell somebody what's an optimal triglyceride, it better be well under 82. And you can see by the time it starts getting close to 100, you are entering the world of cardiovascular risk over time, and God forbid it goes above 110 or above 153, you're in the higher risk ranges. Now, it's per se, not, you know, this is just if you look at that, just panic at much lower levels of triglyceride than you've ever been taught. Here's why. As your liver secretes triglyceride-rich VLDLs, it bumps into your LDLs and HDLs, and it starts swapping triglycerides for cholesterol. To make room for the trigs, the LDL and the HDL send their cholesterol molecules back to the VLDL. In essence, the LDLs and HDLs become cholesterol poor and triglyceride rich, but the VLDL becomes triglyceride poor and cholesterol rich. 
Lipases take the trigs out of the VLDL and you're left with a cholesterol rich remnant VLDL, a quite atherogenic lipoprotein, common in our insulin resistant patients. Now we gotta look at what's the fate of these triglyceride rich LDLs and HDLs. Well, the triglyceride rich HDL will undergo further lipolysis of the remaining triglycerides. It's still loaded with cholesterol and this is how you generate the small LDL particle. Small LDL particles are not re recognized by the LDL receptors. They have terrible clearance. And that's why most people with small LDL particles have horrific LDL particle or ApoB levels. No matter, even if their LDL cholesterol is 62, they have cholesterol depleted, increased numbers of particles. God, this is old data here. Look what happens in blue to LDL cholesterol as your triglycerides goes up, 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 up. Not much. Look what happens to your LDL particle count, your ApoB. It goes through the roof by the time your triglyceride has reached 100 to 150. Please, re if you're not going to do ApoB or LDL particle count, when you see somebody with a trig above 100, just say to yourself, I think I'm dealing with high beta lipoproteinemia, regardless of what the LDL cholesterol is. There's a big LDL, there's a small LDL, but they're normally composed. Normally an LDL has 80% cholesterol, 20% triglycerides. But if you count the molecules of cholesterol per particle, obviously the small particle can't carry as many cholesterol molecules, 2150 as opposed to 2600. Well, wait a minute, there's a real big LDL particle, but it's also cholesterol depleted. Why? It's very blue, isn't it? That is a large triglyceride rich LDL particle, but it can't carry cholesterol. So I would need way more of particle number two there than particle number one on the left to traffic a given level of LDL cholesterol. In the second and third patients, ApoB would be high. In the patient on the left, ApoB might be normal, regardless of their LDL cholesterol. The big particles historically been called pattern A. What would happen if you had a small LDL that was unfortunately packed full of triglycerides? Look how few cholesterol molecules it carries. They have the highest ApoB LDL particle levels. They have been historically called pattern B. Understand that how many cholesterol molecules you have in a given LDL is regulated by both the size of the particle and also the core triglyceride content none of which you're measuring. And this explains why there is often such discordance between ApoB or LDL particle concentrations and LDL cholesterol. Respect triglycerides. Here's a scary thing. LDL cholesterol on the bottom, LDL particle count or ApoB on the y-axis. So if you have an LDL cholesterol of 100, you might be happy in primary prevention, but what is their ApoB or LDL particle level? Well, it might be physiologic, a thousand animals of LDL particles, 80 of ApoB, but it might be tremendous, very low ApoB content, or it might be a total nightmare at 2000. So you can see sometimes LDL cholesterol and LDL particle counts or ApoB correlate with one another, but in many cases they do not. The only possible way for you to know in an individual patient, God, am I dealing with discordance here, is you must measure not only lipid concentrations, but also particle numbers, or at least ApoB. That's the cheapest way of getting a particle number. So very telling and important slide. Finally, the HDLs that are full of triglycerides, which they should never be carrying. Hepatic and endothelial lipase take out the trigs. The HDL becomes very small. If it really becomes super small, it explodes, disassociates, APOA1 goes to the kidney, is catabolized, and the amino acids are excreted, which explains why your patients with escalating triglyceride levels have reduced HDL cholesterol, why your diabetics have low HDL cholesterol. It's basically a function of the triglycerides that catabolize those particles. It's the triglyceride HDL axis disorder, but it's all due to TRIGS. There's a normal uh, HDL, very few triglyceride molecules. This is what is called a fat HDL particles. It's a triglyceride rich HDL. It's gonna be rapidly catabolized and either excreted. If you're measuring sub HDL particles, you won't find big HDLs. 
Look at triglyceride, or excuse me, look at HDL cholesterol. As you go from right to left, HDL cholesterol is going down, down, down. You can see very little interaction with blue LDL, HDL cholesterol, but look what goes through the roof as HDL cholesterol goes down, ApoB or LDL particle count. If you want to know who are those people with low HDL cholesterol that you've been told are high risk, immediately measure ApoB. If it's high, those are the people with low HDL cholesterol get heart disease. If it's normal, turn your attention to ApoB and forget about the HDL cholesterol. And this is why HDL cholesterol, one of the reasons why it's not a goal of therapy, but ApoB is a goal of therapy. Finally, the last thing in the lipid profile, if you're not going to measure ApoB, is if you want to guess it using a lipid metric, use non-HDL cholesterol. And clearly that's defined as the cholesterol that is not within your HDL particles. In essence, it's ApoB cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol plus LDL, plus if you have it, LP little a cholesterol. It's a simple calculation, total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol. You don't have to be fasting, but realize all it is, it's better than LDL cholesterol as a guesstimate of ApoB, but it still leaves a lot to be desired. And I'll show you why Alan Snyderman has published this using NHANES data. You know, if you want a non-HDL cholesterol, and the guidelines would tell you in primary prevention under 130 is pretty good, okay, look what their ApoB might be. It might be spectacular at 85, or it might be a total nightmare at 135. So why would I want to bet your life on non-HDL cholesterol? When ApoB is available in every laboratory in America, it's very cheap. So I don't know. I, many of the guidelines are now moving towards ApoB. If you want to measure ApoB or LDL particle counts, there are the metrics that laboratories are happy to do for you. I guarantee you your hospital lab does apolipoprotein B, or if not, they send it out to their reference lab and you would get it by the next morning. Uh, ApoB is a sum of all those particles, but 90% of them are LDLs. This is why ApoA1 is not your brightest marker. Your HDL particle count counts all of the HDLs except the pre-beta ones. But since they each can carry one to five molecules of ApoA1, HDL particle count really doesn't have a lot to do with ApoA1 concentration. There is almost no reason other than certain genetic lipoprotein disorders to ever measure ApoA1. And for those docs who are checking HDL particle counts, most of them are using NMR spectroscopy or perhaps IM mobility, which Quest offers. Lastly, you know your LDL particles. I hope you all know what LP little a is. It's perhaps the most risky type of lipoprotein, the most atherogenic lipoprotein you can have. And it's an LDL particle that also carries a goofy looking apoprotein called apoprotein little a. You see it's uh, curling around this particle. Notice I divide it into red, green, blue, and yellow, what's called Kringle segments. Uh, your APO little a mass, which would be the weight of that entire APOA protein, pretty much is totally dependent on the size of your Kringle 4 type 2, the only one that differs between individuals. Some people have very small Kringle 4 type 2s, their APOA mass is low. Some people have very big ones, their APOA 1 mass is higher. So, but understand if you have APOA attached, it's a prothrombotic protein, which you certainly don't want an LDL to be, but it's also a carrier of oxidized lipid moieties, which are incredibly injurious to all tissues, including the arterial wall. So those are probably the reasons lipoprotein little a is uh, a big problem. Who should it be checked in? Some guidelines would tell you anybody who's got a premature family history of heart disease or anybody who's had a, an atherothrombotic event in a young event themselves, the European guidelines tells you everybody needs this once in their life. It's a genetic test. It never has to be repeated. You either have it or you don't. So I think in adolescence or, you know, you're screening uh, pediatric populations for FH at age eight nowadays. Why wouldn't you just do an LP little a at that time too? Then it's done. They never need it again. But if it comes back high, you know you are dealing with a causal form of atherosclerosis and also uh, calcific aortic stenosis. These are the different laboratory ways you can get metrics back. Most people get LP little a mass. Very few labs anymore are reporting LP little a particle concentrations. 
if you're doing NMRs, it does not count LP little a particles that the methodology doesn't recognize proteins. And if you are doing NMR uh, LDL particle counts, look on the bottom. Whatever the result comes back, realizing it's just telling you how many LDL particles you have, it does not differentiate them into regular LDL particles and LP little a particles. Uh, here are the guidelines that I've quoted, and uh, I'll be happy to share these references with you afterwards. And the European guidelines is where you want to be nowadays. Oops, let me just go back to that. And if you're going to read any two statements on everything I've taught you today, you want to read part one and part two of the uh, European consensus statement on atherogenesis and lipoproteins published in the last few years. They also have an incredible published last year guideline on the management of dyslipidemia. It's far superior to anything published in the United States, although the United States guidelines are right behind them. And I want to conclude by always saying thank you to the guys who preceded us all. And you're looking at a guy there called Dr. John Goffman, who of all things was a nuclear physicist, but he's the first guy who ever stuck a test tube in a centrifuge. And when he spun it down, he recognized, what are these things that are floating around here? And he discovered lipoproteins and he gave them their names according to their buoyancy. Uh, John is now deported, uh, departed, uh, but we, would be so far behind in our knowledge of lipoproteins had he not done his uh, work. And in 2007, he is the only person that has ever been made an automatic lifetime member of the National Lipid Association for his incredible contributions. So I like to say thank you to him. So I'm um, done. I hope I didn't go too much over time. I have 14,000 Twitter followers if you'd like to join. All I tweet about is lipids. So thank you very much for having me. Dr. Dayspring, could you hear me? Yep. Can I ask you a question? Uh, what treatment options are available and how uh, efficacious are they for elevated LP little a? Uh, the current standards for if you believe somebody has high LP little a, which is contributing to their cardiovascular risk, right now we have no approved or recognized uh, therapeutic avenue that stops the liver from producing APOA. Such trials are underway with uh, anti-sense uh, uh, mechanism of action drugs that will prohibit the liver from making APOA, and we'll see what those trials show. Right now, the approach to people who have high LP little a is to do whatever you can do to normalize APOB and do what you can do to mitigate every other cardiovascular risk factor, insulin resistant, blood pressure, diabetes, thrombotic issues, blah, 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 blah. So blow away APOB. And the standard of care, therefore, our number one APOB modulating drug is statin therapy. So statin should be. In some people, and it's a complex reason why, you might get a slight increase in LP little a, Remember, with total LDL particle concentrations, LP little a is a minority particle. So it's basically irrelevant if a statin might increase LP little a mass a little bit, because at the same time, the statin is vastly clearing your LDL particles that don't have APOA attached, and that reduces cardiovascular risk. So uh, it's a statin. If the statin doesn't get you to APOB go, we use our adjunctive uh, APOB lowering goals, and right now that would be ezetimibe, benpidoic acid, or if it's a very high risk person or a very rich person, we would go to a PCSK9 inhibitor, which incidentally also lowers the LP little a metric, unlike the statins or ezetimibe, and we're waiting, does that matter? The post hoc analysis of the PCSK9 inhibitor trials do show it does seem to matter in people with LP little a, but that's a way off label use. Got it. Thank you. And as an aside, I really enjoyed your podcast with Peter Atiyah. Thank you so much. Peter is a wonderful guy. And if where you read my Who I Am uh, to your audience, I uh, am an employee of his nowadays, and I help him with the lipid management of his patients. So it's a great honor. Thank you, Dr. Spring, for this nice overview. Uh, I'm Romana Shaiban. I'm one of the endocrinologists here at Christ. 
Um, since you showed us and you said that uh, how important the NMR particle size is, why is it that it is not well included in the current guidelines and it's not as emphasized? Well, that's a good question because LDL particle size, although it explains to you some of the discordance between LDL cholesterol and LDL particle count, the only thing that matters is LDL particle concentration, which you get by looking at LDL-P, not LDL size, or APOB. Remember, people with familial hypercholesterolemia have virtually no small LDL particles, but they have a horrific incidence of atherosclerotic heart disease. They have all large LDL particles. So the size of the LDL is not the number one driving factor of atherogenesis. It's particle number. So as a lipidologist, all I care about is do you have too many LDL particles? I don't care whether you have big or small. My mission is to get rid of them. But as an endocrinologist, I think what you could take from it if somehow you saw LDL size is small, and you could maybe guess that by looking at the triglyceride HDL ratio in non-African Americans, or escalating triglycerides, uh, you would know you're dealing with an insulin resistant person. And as an endocrinologist, you know there's plenty of options you have on the table to improve insulin sensitivity apart from lipoprotein modulation. So uh, you don't need LDL size. It's interesting, it's important, so you understand what drives ApoB or LDL particle count, but I don't think we need that measured. Thank you. Dr. Dayspring, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for this excellent review. My name is Amr Nafi. I'm one of the cardiologists here at Christ. Um, I was just wondering if you don't mind sharing your thoughts on the icosapent ethyl. You know, you mentioned the, the role of tri hypertriglyceridemia, and obviously that's been a controversial study. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, it certainly uh, <laughs> was a shot to the jaw for all of us. I mean, we were all hoping it was going to be a positive trial. But what we know from the REDUCE IT trial, and for those who don't understand, that was a pretty large trial where they enrolled people with triglycerides above 135. Some of them had low HDL cholesterol, not all did. Most of them were at increased risk for cardiovascular disease because there were a lot of diabetics, insulin resistant people, or they had subclinical heart disease. So it was a high risk person. And they knew that, hey, omega-3s are a triglyceride lowering therapy. So let's get everybody to their LDL goal with either statins or statins or zetamide, which they did. And then they said, let's on top of that add four grams, two grams twice a day with meals of icosapentaenoic acid, which is only one of the omega-3 fatty acids that are available in our supplements. And lo and behold, they had a dramatic reduction of residual risk beyond statin, azetamide, LDL cholesterol reduction. So it pretty much makes it standard of care. If you have a person who meets the criteria for that trial, why are you not giving them four grams of icosapentaenoic acid? But here's the cool thing, that the benefit of that drug had nothing to do with its effect on triglyceride reduction. So the magical mystery effects of omega-3 fatty acids which are probably anti-inflammatory in nature. They affect resolvins and protectins. They affect cell membrane signaling. We don't know why they work, but they do work. So certainly you're like yourself and a cardiologist. Uh, you need, if you're not already doing it, have to uh, think in your mind, man, who should I be adding uh, EPA to? You do know there was a trial. It hasn't been published yet, but the sponsor announced it. It was with a same four grams of EPA plus DHA, and they just stopped it at two years because it was no. That doesn't mean it wouldn't have worked had they continued it, and we're awaiting at least publication of that trial or see where there are other confounders in there. But right now, if you want to be evidence-based, you'd be using the EPA. I would warn you, your brain needs DHA, so I wouldn't not. <laughs> uh, prescribe DHA for anybody, at least it's low in the plasma. But it's a real new intriguing add-on. Also as a cardiologist, and we can't go here today, you know several of the medicines that have, have been approved to use in diabetes, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, GSGL-2 uh, T2 inhibitors, dramatically reduce cardiovascular risk in patients with coronary disease diabetes. So they've become a new important tool for cardiologists. The bad news is if you're a cardiologist treating the patients 
of course need lifestyle, but they need about six other drugs with it. And that gets complicated. If you're talking, Chad, I don't hear you. Oh, I see you're muted. Can you hear us now? Is there is there any situation where your ApoB and your LDL particle number are discordant? Sure. Uh, if you are one of those diabetics who has triglyceride-rich LDLs or uh, small LDLs, your LDL cholesterol might be perfectly normal and your ApoB could be in the stratosphere. So this explains a lot of the residual risk in diabetics and insulin-resistant people who have pretty good-looking LDL cholesterol levels, but still ugly ApoB particles. I was one of the authors in a study probably 10 years ago in the American Journal of Cardiology showing even at LDL cholesterols of 50, a significant number of people can have still have an increased ApoB or LDL particle count. And that's why you have to measure it. Thank you so much. I think with that, we will conclude Grand Rounds and we are incredibly appreciative of your time and your expertise. Thank you so much, Dr. Day Spring. Take care, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.